Um, I'd like to thank, uh, before we even start, Nicola, uh, who's been organizing the chess seminars and gets us all here and stays around to make sure everything works uh, and um, has interesting comments as well. Um, and uh, today we've got Andy Fletcher, who's been with chess for a long time. He was the postdoc on the K4U project. And I've been at scads of, scads of interesting seminars with Andy. And I think it's the first time I've ever heard, we'll have heard anything start to finish entirely from Andy. And we're all really looking forward to it. Uh, and and uh, I think he's gonna to talk to us about what it's like uh, to be thrust into the middle of an interdisciplinary project that has a lot of philosophy in it when that's something you don't know very much about and just interdisciplinarity in general. So um, it, it's been a real treat to have Andy on this project. I mean, I've been you know, praising him right, left and center uh, and uh, wish, wish he could just stay on forever. Anyway, over to you, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see that? Um, I can. Yes, okay. we can. Yep. Fab. Now I need to get you all out of the way so I can read my damn script. Wait a moment. Okay, let's just go. Um, so this talk is going to be, a, well, it is a collection of thoughts around my experience working on an interdisciplinary project called Knowledge for Use. And um, mainly it's been absolutely fascinating and a privilege to work with such a diverse and interesting team. Um, but this being my first postdoc, there are some aspects of interdisciplinary research that I hadn't expected. Um, so I'm going to talk around these. And this, this might resonate more with early career researchers, um, but I, I kind of want to cover enough different issues and perspectives that there's something relevant to everybody. Um, so it'll mainly be anecdotal and, and therefore hopefully a relaxing talk. Um, not for me, but, you know. Um, so I'll explain the... Uh, Oh, hold on, slides. I'm gonna uh, explain the context first, um, my background and uh, how I ended up working in this department. Um, oh, all right, I've got too many things on my screen. Bear with me, <laughs> sorry about this. Right, context, why surprisingly, um, how I ended up working in the philosophy department. Uh, and then knowledge for use, uh, which is our project, which combines social science and philosophy. Um, and I'll describe two case studies from that, um, which I've been working on. Um, and these should illustrate some broader reflections on interdisciplinary working uh, and what it now means to me and how I might go about using it in future approaches. So uh, first of all, a bit about my background and, and therefore my ethos in respect to this talk. Um, I had what might be called a, a squiggly career um, I did music, undergraduate, master's level, and that was a lot of fun, but not terribly useful career-wise. Um, after a foray into journalism and some freelance writing, I ended up in professional support at Northumbria University. Um, but I didn't really enjoy my particular job role, so eventually took a severance opp opportunity and was very lucky to get a funded PhD shortly thereafter. So... The PhD, um, oh, sorry about that. the PhD evaluated music interventions um, that aim to improve mental health um, using a realist evaluation approach. But um, the problem was that I'd never done social science before. Um, the music degree was focused around cultural theory and bits of continental philosophy at, at most, and that was fascinating. But it's it's not so useful when talking about realism and methods and policy and so on, um, at least not at PhD level. So on the PhD, it was good to get my teeth into theories that were new to me um, and that arguably had a more concrete basis. So following that, I was attracted to, oh, have I just switched to my script and away from the PowerPoint? No, we can no. still see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I'm getting weird highlights on the screen. Um, I was attracted to knowledge for use then, mainly because it was health and policy related, um, but also I'll be totally honest, because of David Byrne. So for um, anyone who doesn't know David Byrne, he's a very straight talking sociologist um, who I'd cited quite a lot in my PhD. Um, so I was, I was quite lucky to be hired as an RA um, working on one of his case studies. Um, and just as a, a fun incidental fact, I was less familiar with PI Nancy Cartwright when I applied. Um, 
as he was in San Diego at the time. But it turns out um, I've subsequently realized that I cited her as well in my PhD and luckily um, in a good way. So that's a relief. Um, we've avoided any potential arguments there. Um, so I was based for two years in the School of Applied Social Science, which is now the sociology department at Durham. And that was useful because um, I managed to boost my social science knowledge by taking on some teaching and hanging around with other sociologists. And then I got absorbed into the philosophy department where knowledge for use actually lives. And I've been there ever since, um, feeling slightly like an imposter, but um, willing to learn. And so um, that's where the surprisingly in the title comes from. I didn't set out to work in a philosophy department and it's taken some time to understand what that might mean for my career as a social scientist. So moving on, sorry, Nancy, for the photo. Um, for those that aren't familiar, Knowledge for Use is a six year ERC funded research project that brings together six social science case studies, mainly around health, with two philosophy based research streams. Um, the idea being to use concrete evidence along with philosophical insights around deliberating and building better social policies, ones that are more fair and more reliable. Each case study was led by an expert in that field um, from across disciplines. And then we had a philosopher looking at building social policy, uh, an economist looking at policy deliberation and advisors and associates from various allied fields. Um, so it was a well-resourced project, or is a well-resourced project. Um, but the key here isn't that a philosophy project combined forces with social science. Um, that isn't such a great leap. And, philosophy of social science is already a thing. Um, it's more the tricky little overlaps, the, like the handover between empirical sociology type work and philosophical abstractions um, with a view that each might inform the other and strengthening both. And, and that's where I sort of found some challenges. So the case studies themselves were initially quite loosely defined. Um, Research questions emerged as the studies progressed, and this makes intuitive sense um, to take emergent ideas based in concrete reality and abstract them. Um, while that happens in social science, I don't know many social science projects that explicitly team up with philosophers and work in that same way. Um, in fact, very occasionally I encountered some slightly unfair stereotypes about both disciplines, um, but, but these were rare, so I'm not gonna get into those. I also became acutely aware of my lack of formal training in philosophy and um, also my relatively recent entry into social science. Um, so definitely not the grounding that an undergraduate degree would have given me. But on the flip side, um, I'm fairly flexible to new ways of thinking or approaches. I like to stick ideas together in weird ways. Um, and when you do music or, or other creative arts, I suppose, um, a certain amount of naivety can often open up some interesting avenues. Um, not always, but sometimes. So encountering concepts for the first time can be quite energizing, I found. Um, and in fact, making errors um, when you're just playing with ideas can also be quite constructive. And I make a lot of errors. Um, so I think I maybe underestimated what an unusual project knowledge for use is when I applied. Most of my PhD colleagues went off to do postdocs with a fairly straightforward research question and a predetermined roadmap, um, whereas Knowledge for Use had quite a lot more freedom in terms of what could be examined within its broad structure. Um, and now the project's drawing to a close, it's got me thinking about interdisciplinary research and its implications, both good and bad, for an early career researcher. So um, here's a quick overview of two of the knowledge for use case studies. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw on these to illustrate a discussion around interdisciplinarity. So uh, the evidence case study. Reconfiguring local health economies began as a sort of timeline of health service reconfigurations in Greater Manchester, UK. Greater Manchester is a devolved city region in charge of its own health and social care budget. Um, it makes its own decisions around how these services are organized and delivered. And so we looked at how these decisions were made um, and which types of evidence were prioritized and how changing NHS structures 
wider political and economic context governed that. And we found out, um, that's David Byrne and I, what you would probably expect, which is that it mostly comes down to politics and money. Um, I know that's an oversimplification. Um, and so it, that could have been quite a dull project, um, plowing through meeting minutes and policy documents. Um, but David Byrne turned it into, I would say, a masterclass in making me work and making things interesting. So he's quite hot on philosophy anyway, um, and also on teasing out interesting conclusions. So he sent me on quite a lot of wild goose chases, um, but then we also spent a lot of time chatting informally in the Lit and Phil in Newcastle. If you haven't been, you should go, it's great. Um, and the tea and coffee's free. Uh, and this created the, the conditions for a more interesting inquiry. So I diligently did the desk work and then made some theoretical leaps and then I'd bring them back to David and he would either say, that's bollocks, or you might be onto something. And that was a fun way of working and it was quite unbounded. So what did we find out? Well, mixing different forms of evidence gives rise to a, a sort of hybrid form of decision-making that's incredibly sensitive to political and economic contexts. Um, so it's often impossible to predict the way a decision will go given all the variables, for example, Clinical evidence can be sidelined by some economic detail or evidence from a public consultation might just trump epidemiological data depending on the organizational structure in place and its, its needs. None of this is surprising. So we turned our attention to the word evidence in evidence-based policy. And our insight came from an unpopular decision, um, a decision to effectively downgrade a hospital that went to judicial review. So suddenly, uh, where we'd been looking at how different types of entity evidence stack up and acquire different values, we were now looking at a situation where what was being examined was whether an administrative process had been followed. So all the little bits of facts and data became less relevant, and the thing that mattered was the process that they'd been entered into. Instead of having to decide if a clinical fact was more important than an economic fact, the decision became about um, who had adhered more to the rules. So we went from looking at entities and assigning values to them, to looking at a process with its own set of legal values. So that screwed up our timeline approach. Um, and we wrote instead about how narrowly evidence is defined in relation to evidence-based practice and how fragile that definition is when things take a legal turn. And we concluded that evidence is a slippery, multi-layered word. Um, it's often used fairly uncritically. And so perhaps social scientists um, should be more careful in using that word. So that was an interesting observation in itself. Um, I tried also to see how it fitted in with philosophical concepts of evidence, um, its forms, how it's used, how it's treated, and so on. Um, but I, I've got to admit, I struggled a bit with mapping things across from our study in a clean way um, onto the philo philosophical ideas. So there's, there's scope for more work to be done there. And when it came to publishing, um, part of the problem was in setting out our ethos. Um, so who are you? What are you researching? And to which field are you trying to contribute? Um, so we had to spend some time carefully framing the argument. Um, but our paper's with social theory and health now, and hopefully on the verge of being published. So that was the, uh, the evidence case study. Um, the second one I'm gonna talk about is the epistemic injustice case study. Um, it's actually about mental health, but it became about epistemic injustice. So this was an evaluation of a program that aimed to help job seekers overcome mental health barriers to employment. So the program integrated both health and welfare services. And I worked with Jeremy Clark, who is a psychoanalytic psychotherapist and a government advisor on mental health. And we looked at factors that either helped or hindered the program. And we quickly noticed that the hindrances were mainly caused by knowledge inequalities. Specifically, there was a deference to clinical knowledge over other forms of knowledge, such as experiential or knowledge of the welfare system or of community resources and so on. So clinical decisions nearly always won out. Um, screening mechanisms were built around medical models with no acknowledgement of social complexity. 
um, communication systems and databases excluded certain types of information that would have been relevant to individual cases. Uh, higher up, the various agencies involved um, refused to properly understand one another. Um, I hope none of them are watching. Having invested different resources, which they equated with different values. So here, um, the clinical perspective was systematically undervalued by managers and commissioners who saw it as being secondary to efficiency considerations. So we hooked onto this idea of epistemic injustice, treating people differently because of the type of knowledge they have. And that resulted in uh, two insights, really. Um, one, unintentional epistemic injustice was caused not just by social norms, but also by a bureaucratic system that filtered out certain voices or prioritized certain knowledge. Um, it wasn't the result of individual identity prejudices. Everybody respected one another and they genuinely wanted what was best for the client. And this is important because it indicates which technological aspects of a program or a system might be improved, but it also draws attention to um, well-established systems that are built on assumptions that might harm similar programs where diverse knowledge types are integrated. The second thing we noticed was that um, once we explained epistemic injustice to the key workers and talking therapists, that they're the frontline workers who we um, had interviews with, they understood straight away and identified workarounds, um, such as more informal communication, three-way meetings, explaining decisions and mechanisms to one another and so on. Um, once they had a term for what was happening, they were able to understand their frustrations and, and they begun to find ways to overcome them. So there was some irony in the fact that once the participants had some knowledge about a knowledge based inequality, they could partially solve the issue themselves, although the managers and the commissioners were less easy to convince. So I'm not entirely sure where our idea to pursue epistemic injustice came from originally. Um, I know we spoke about it at a meeting in Venice, but it's likely that um, we wouldn't have hit upon it if we hadn't been thinking about the project within philosophy. Most of the literature on epistemic injustice certainly sits within that discipline. So in writing about it, it still feels like we're borrowing a concept rather than genuinely integrating ideas. Um, even though we're trying to explore epistemic injustice as a more organizational systems based problem, um, there's still a sense of applying it rather than developing or, or moving the concept forward. But that said, um, we've discussed this further within Knowledge for Use, and it's opened up a lot of ideas about evidence synthesis, integrated health and social care, and um, potential analogues across various other fields. Um, and in fact, my wife, who works for UKRI, um, she's taken up the idea of epistemic injustice in the HE sector, um, and that seems to be gaining an awful lot of traction within the emerging research culture agenda. So again, there's room to go further with this, but the case study opened up a few avenues anyway, including some which are of potential relevance to interdisciplinary research itself. So I'm just gonna have some water. Uh, those case studies could quite easily have been standalone projects in their own right. Each enabled us to say something useful that at least skirted the realms of philosophy um, had there been infinite resources, it would have been good to have had each case study co-led by a social scientist and a philosopher, because then the philosopher could have pulled the discussion into their discipline and, and helped develop the ideas from that perspective. Um, but then equally, they, they might not have needed a research associate. So swings and roundabouts. Um, so it was kind of, it was like, it was the fuzziness and the overlap between philosophy and social science that allowed us to do this work. Um, and that also made it slightly difficult to know when and what to hand over to another expert. This might have been a combination of my own lack of experience. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know um, and perhaps not quite knowing how to describe half formed conclusions to some of my colleagues, um, especially when people are busy. So the next section of this talk, um, we'll get into what some others have had to say about interdisciplinary research. Erin Leahy uh, describes two studies. Uh, one among 900 scientists, mostly engineers, uh, found that 
collaborating on interdisciplinary projects yielded more visibility in terms of citations, but reduced productivity by 9.6% over a career. Um, and this is a relationship that she calls the productivity penalty. She also notes that uh, the cognitive dissimilarity between fields is also a factor in the visibility boost. Um, so titles that relate seemingly unconnected things grab attention. Although um, as a side note, there are some well-known exceptions. Um, so I'm sure we're all cautious of studies that um, mix postmodernism with quantum gravity. Um, but as it is, uh, social science and philosophy have quite a lot of overlap anyway. Um, and two, the other thing, the other study that Erin Leahy did um, was a small scale qualitative study among um, more relevantly English literature, history and philosophy academics. And she found that interdisciplinary research requires extra cognitive effort and additional time to produce. So not that different from the first study really. And the interviewees also expressed a need for more support from their institutions of colleagues. Um, but notably, she only spoke to academics with several years of experience in interdisciplinary work. So perhaps that's a nod towards the bewilderment that it can cause among um, early career researchers. Um, my experience, I, I suspect, might have been unusual. Um, I've been quite I've been well supported and relatively free to get on with things. And um, I've had some really good supervision from quite a few people. Um, but, you know, I could identify a bit with Leahy's participants. Um, so, for example, I sometimes found reading up on concepts a bit slow going. Um, uh, so discussions um, of evidence based policy can be uh, can be relatively straightforward in social science. And, and in that Cartwright and Byrne both take fairly critical stances. Um, but I did struggle a bit reading up on evidence as per the law and as per philosophy. Um, so the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on that, which seems to be the go-to um, for philosophers, that gets quite dense. Um, but you know, perhaps it's a bit like journalism where you have to be able to quickly become an expert in a wide range of things and adapt your message for different audiences. So um, one of our KFU colleagues who I can see right now, Catherine Furman, um, recently said on Facebook, uh, as a philosopher, I could notionally work on anything I like. Um, so there's a lot of freedom, uh, but you have to be flexible enough to use it well. Sorry, Catherine. Um, so one thing to consider, I suppose, based on that, if you have the freedom would be deciding whether to go for surface level understandings and putting lots of effort into collaboration, um, or being prepared to dig a little deeper and working a bit more independently. And both are perfectly valid as far as I can see, but it, it can perhaps be useful to have a clear idea about that from the outset. Closer to home, Durham's own Marco Bernini, um, I don't know if anyone's met him, he's a nice guy, um, from Cognitive Science and Literary Studies, um, spoke a couple of weeks back on interdisciplinarity. And um, I was a bit worried because I'd already submitted this abstract, um, but his focus was on hybrid fields such as medical humanities, which aim to naturalize and cancel out some of the disjoints in interdisciplinary research. Um, but he also points out that in such fields, assimilation is slow and there are still difficulties in defining their parameters. Um, so he conceptualized um, real as opposed to armchair disciplinary, interdisciplinary research using the metaphor of an opposable thumb. Um, and on his presentation, there was a very big copyright sign. So I just want to re-emphasize that this is Marco Bernini's idea, not mine. Um, so he says that in interdisciplinary research, the thumb is your home discipline, and the other fingers um, are other disciplines. So the thumb is connected by several muscles and it's capable of moving in a few different ways. Um, it interacts with the other digits to perform various actions and the hand as a cohesive whole can perform a huge range of complex tasks. The important thing is what you do with your thumb. Um, I, just, I just thought it was a good takeaway quote. Um, to go slightly more pragmatic though, still with Bernini, um, on publishing, he identifies three directions for exchange um, between his disciplines. So I won't reiterate what he said um, because that's on the slide and you can get the gist. 
that he's been able to use this framework to organize and target his outputs very effectively. Because this is my first postdoc position, I don't have the wealth of publications to map onto that, um, but I can make a couple of observations. So our first paper on epistemic injustice went to a philosophy journal. And um, I'd initially put a lot of detail in about methods and lots of quotes to support our argument, but the reviewers wanted more about the nuances of epistemic injustice that already exist, you know, to show that we're filling a gap. So I had to knit together um, other little bits of, sort of philosophy to provide the context for our own little contribution. Um, and this kind of involved modulating into a different writing style. Um, and that, was, that wasn't too difficult. Um, speaking of modulation, I know I'm reading this from a script, but I'm trying to make it sound casual. Um, speaking of modulation, um, it's a bit like a key change in music. It's not that difficult. Um, and it's the same piece of music, but you do have to pay attention to what you're doing because it can throw you. Off the back of that um, paper, I was asked to write a chapter uh, for a handbook of disability studies. Um, and much of the existing literature on epistemic injustice and disability also sits within philosophy and it's quite theoretical. So inevitably the feedback I got from there was make it less philosophical and more disability focused. And again, it's a fair comment. Um, so I'm redrafting that now in a more applied style. Um, so switching between different modes to address different scientific communities is, is perfectly reasonable and it isn't beyond most people, but there does seem to be a tendency to want writers to pin their colors to the mast from the outset. Um, so I found being honest about the interdisciplinary nature of knowledge for use threw up a lot of questions with some journals, um, but perhaps I just need to target them better. Um, Bernini has more experience. Uh, he notes, it changes your writing style. It's not just triple the effort. So I said in the abstract that interdisciplinary research is prized by funders. But this talk uh, has ended up being more inward looking, um, not how I planned it, but that's the way it went. Um, but one thing I will note is that funders get more bang for their buck when they fund interdisciplinary research. So for example, Global Challenges or the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, aim to address big problems that, that span multiple disciplines anyway, but that can lead to interdisciplinarity perhaps becoming a bit of a buzzword. Um, the other thing is that funding policies are or um, should be informed by researchers. Uh, this is called the Haldane principle. I only found that out today. Um, so researchers themselves should know where and why and how they need to interact with other disciplines. So again, um, it isn't just a buzzword, but in a competitive environment, it can seem like one. And that's where good research support comes in um, to mitigate potentially harmful cynical attitudes and to ensure that interdisciplinarity is properly understood in the funding context. So everybody has a role to play in creating a positive research culture and in doing interdisciplinarity in an informed and meaningful way. Um, and thinking about how often I've seen the term interdisciplinarity in relation to all manner of projects, it does sort of feel like it's everywhere and that it might occasionally be used a bit uncritically. Um, I don't wanna say it's a slippery term because difficult concepts always get described as being slippery. Um, I said that evidence was a slippery term earlier on. But since we're on the subject, here's one final awkward metaphor. Earlier on, uh, I showed a picture of a hydra, this one. Um, and I like this picture because uh, it's missing the two back legs. And I don't know if they're de that's deliberate or if they've just been sort of forgotten about. Either way, I like the picture. Um, it's a common metaphor for interdisciplinarity. So for example, at Edinburgh University, there was a journal called Hydra, the Interdisciplinary Journal of Social Sciences. Um, but being a mythological beast, we don't know much about the consciousness of a hydra. So do those separate heads act independently or together? Um, I'm sure a classic scholar would know, but perhaps a better metaphor might be an octopus. And uh, again, thanks to Elliot for mentioning octopuses the other day. Uh, I only found out about this recently. So the philosopher P. 
Peter Godfrey Smith, while scuba diving one day, became interested in the consciousness of octopi, um, actually a cuttlefish, but they're in the same class. Um, and this isn't a new type of question. Um, Thomas Nagel famously asked, what is it like to be a bat? The thing about octopi is that they have much larger nervous systems than other invertebrates. Um, their brains evolved completely separately from those of vertebrates. And they share no common anatomy, yet they have many of the same features and functions as we do, um, such as being able to recognize individual people, short and long-term memory, exploration through play, and so on. Um, and they can coordinate all of this to solve elaborate problems, both environmental and novel. So Peter Godfrey Smith suggests that essentially octopi have a, a completely alien form of intelligence. So with that in mind, and perhaps because there's some visual overlap, uh, a good, maybe good interdisciplinary research is more like an octopus. Each arm can operate independently and pursue separate specialist tasks, but there is a centralized locus of intelligence. Um, while we haven't got a complete handle on that, we can see that octopi are capable of a wide range of interesting things and they're fun animals anyway, um, valuable contributors to the marine environment. So I'm sure this metaphor will have been made before, but um, my core point is um, a hydra, as Bernini would put it, is a resilient monstrosity. Um, bear in mind, Bernini uh, does sort of literature and stuff. Um, so a resilient monstrosity, lots of separate parts, but lacking integration and chaotic. Uh, whereas the octopus represents emergent harmony, it has distinguishable discrete parts whose integration leads to a new organic system. Interdisciplinarity is not a monster, it just needs a bit of understanding. So Knowledge for Use brought a couple of disciplines together that already share a lot of common ground, and it's a really cool project to be involved with. As an early career researcher, um, you're trying to convince people that you know your stuff in one discipline, um, but there's always a danger of being judged by a different set of um, standards in another discipline. And I was, um, or I am, I, I'm, I'm acutely aware of this, um, because like everybody, um, I have strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it's been really interesting, regardless, working between two disciplines, but there's always a sense that you should be better at your own discipline. Um, so a PhD level, there's a lot of advice and workshops designed to help you get a job. But at postdoc level, much of the advice is um, subject specific. It, is, it assumes you already know the structure of your particular discipline, or it's kind of high level, like in the researcher concordat, um, which is it's about university policies and it says that we'll help you or it's anecdotal um, so it comes from academics at different points in their careers with different experiences and this this can be bewildering um, and it tends to boil down to uh, one of two bits of advice both of which i have received um, so either capitalize on the experience be flexible show diversity in your thinking and approaches or um, get good at something don't fall between the cracks and don't be a dilettante, dilettant, dilettant. Um, it's often said, um, mainly by Adrian Harris, who works on knowledge for use, although he didn't coin this phrase, um, that specialists know more and more about less and less, while generalists know less and less about more and more. And um, David Epstein explores this in his book, Range, but it becomes very concrete when you're pitching yourself in a job interview. So my current task is um, how to describe that interdisciplinary experience in a way that's useful rather than wavering. And uh, I mentioned briefly before, um, but research culture is changing. Um, in higher education, the push is to be more inclusive of diverse knowledges and to be flexible. And this, is, this is coming from a range of organizations like Wellcome, UKRI and the Royal Society and so on. So it's, there's an opportunity to also think about collaboration and interdisciplinarity in perhaps a more octopus-like way. And um, the stuff I've learned on Knowledge for Use really has been from all directions, not just from academics, um, but also from professional support staff and students and all the incidental conversations that we've sort of had around the, the project. So, to end this quite rambly talk, um, I'd like to appeal to you guys and um, ladies, women, um, 
my overarching question is where do uh, we or I go from here? Um, and since that might potentially invite some rather blunt answers, um, I'm going to set out some starting points for the discussion. Um, so is it useful for some of those margins between philosophy and social science to remain blurry or do these types of projects benefit from better delineation? Um, on a related note, is the fact that it can't be pinned down a good thing? Um, for example, one of the things that I like about medical humanities is that I've been able to take my ideas into that world without feeling like an imposter because there isn't really a solid boundary around medical humanities. Um, there seem to be some unresolved issues for researchers working interdisciplinarily. Uh, do we need to give those more attention or is it fine? Um, I don't know, I've only got this one experience. And uh, finally, what should I do to make the best of this experience? Given the privilege of working on knowledge for use, um, I don't wanna let that experience go to waste. So that's the end of the talk. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks. I can't hear anyone. <laughs>